So let's suppose we have this square plate right here and the square plate is pinned at the very bottom left corner and we have this string here that's suspending the plate at least initially and what I'm going to do at some point is I'm going to cut the string so when I cut the string this plate's going to start swinging about the pin point it's going to rotate clockwise and downward now my problem is as follows let's say I'm given the mass of the plate given gravity I'm always given gravity but I'm giving you the half width and half height of this square plate so given those quantities what I want to do is I want to find uh, the pin forces horizontal and vertical components of this pin force at the instant or immediately immediately after the string is cut now if you've been following along in a previous problem I gave you this exact same almost the exact same problem exact same setup at least and I asked you immediately after the string is cut whether this pin is pushing to the right or to the left or neither right nor left and I asked you whether that pin force is pushing upward with the force equal to the weight, bigger than the weight, or less than the weight. And in that problem, we answered these questions without actually going through the entire analysis and finding out the actual forces. What we're going to do now is find the actual forces in terms of, of mass here, acceleration due to gravity, and the size of the plate. So I'm going to start this problem off with a free body diagram of the plate. Now the, the plate is free to rotate about the pin. However, the pin keeps that corner of the plate fixed in space. It doesn't move to the right or to the left. So I need a force. I'll call it Px in the i-hat direction that keeps uh, that pin from wandering left and right. And another force, or actually the same force, but another component of that force, Py in the j-hat direction uh, pushing up and down and furthermore my plate has mass it has weight and if I assume that the the mass in this plate is uniformly distributed then that center of mass that center of gravity is right at the center of the plate so I get a force acting straight down through the center equal to the weight of this thing like so now before I draw my mass acceleration diagram let me think about what uh, physical principles I'm going to be using so let me scroll this up here like so. So since the plate is a rigid body, I plan on using Euler's equations, or Euler's principle here, which quite simply state that if we look at all the external forces acting on the body, this has to equal mass times the acceleration of the center of mass of the body. And there's also a moment equation too, right? So we take our external moments and that has to equal something. Before I write that down, let, let's, let's, uh, let's think about what this, this first equation says. Because remember, what I'm after are the forces, right? I want to know what Px and Py, those are forces. Ooh, I can maybe get to that. So if I can find the acceleration of the center mass, then I know what the forces are. So now that I know I'm looking for some accelerations here, let me start drawing my mass acceleration diagram. Now we see the thing that matters here is the acceleration of the center mass, and the center mass is accelerating. It has a horizontal component, I'll call it MAGX in the i-hat direction, and it also has a vertical component, MAGY in the j-hat direction. Now let's look what we've got going on with this first uh, piece of the Euler's equations right here. So in the i-hat direction, if I just have PX, and that's it, that's my only force in, in the horizontal direction. This has to equal the m times the agx, that component of the acceleration. In the j hat direction, I've got py, I've got minus the weight. This has to equal agy, or the vertical component of the acceleration in the center mass. Now the thing is, I have two equations so far. I've got two unknowns. Actually, well, I've got two unknowns that I really want, px and py. But also these components of the acceleration are not, not known either. So I'm going to have to go to my moment equation. In fact, that's really what's going to give me these accelerations so that I can find those Px and Py. All right, so now let's go to that moment equation. And let's look at the general form of that moment equation. Let's say I take moment about some point I'm going to call Q. Q is some point on the body, any point on the body. In that case, you recall our derivation said that this is equal to Rg relative to Q cross mass times the acceleration of point Q plus moment of inertia about Q times the angular acceleration. Woo, lots of stuff there. Now, of course, just like in statics, we can choose the point we want to take moments about, and some points are more intelligent as far as taking moments than other points. Now, whenever you have a body rotating about a fixed point, one of the obvious choices is to choose uh, this point Q you're, you're taking moments about to be the point that is fixed, the point in which you're rotating about, in this case, the, the pinpoint, right? The reason why that's kind of nice, actually there's two reasons why it's nice, is because if I take moments about point P right here, 
or the pin right here, notice that the, the, the pin forces don't appear in that moment. That's kind of cool. But also, as far as this right-hand side goes, the pin point does not accelerate. It doesn't move at all. So if I choose to take moments about that pin point, then this term goes away, just leaving me with the moment of inertia times angular acceleration. So what I'm going to do is choose to take moments about point P, not some arbitrary point Q, but rather P, very specific pin joint. This is going to be the moment of inertia about that pin joint times the angular acceleration. Aha! So this will allow me to finish up my mass acceleration diagram, by the way, because here's my other inertial relationship. So my moment about point P, that has to equal moment of inertia times angular acceleration. So here's the MA part of that moment equation, right? Inertia times an angular acceleration. And I'm going to put this on my mass acceleration diagram as well. So here it is on my mass acceleration. There's the moment of inertia times angular acceleration. Now you might ask, why is this angular acceleration going counterclockwise? I know when I, when I cut that string there, the thing's going to rotate the opposite way. But just as I've been doing all semester long, I write these unknown accelerations in the positive direction. In this case, since I've already defined i and j to be horizontal and vertical directions, positive is oriented this way, then k hat is i cross j, k is out of the page. So a positive ex angular acceleration in the k hat direction would be counterclockwise. Now I fully expect that alpha to be less than zero when we work it out in the mathematics. And we'll see that, I hope. So now when I write out this moment equation in its components, so I'll pull out the k-hat direction. Moment in the k-hat direction would be uh, counterclockwise. Let's actually go up and look at that free body diagram again. There it is. So remember, we're taking moments about the pin. So the pin forces, px and py, do not create a moment. The only other force that can create a moment is the weight. And notice that the weight's creating a moment about the pin in the counterclockwise direction. So this is a negative moment equal to the actual force, m times g, and the distance that goes into the moment is this distance, the, this horizontal distance from the, the center mass to the pin. Remember the total distance along the plate was 2 times b, so the, so the, the distance of the center mass from the left edge of the plate is just b, so there's my moment. And coming back up, so this moment has to equal moment of inertia, IP, times alpha. Well, that's kind of cool, because this will allow me to solve for my angular acceleration. Alpha is going to be uh, minus m times g times b, all divided by the moment of inertia about point P. Remember, moment of inertia is pure positive numbers, so is b, so is g, so is m. So this angular acceleration is negative, right? That's what we expected. We wanted our angular acceleration to be negative. And lo and behold, that's what we got. So in this expression for angular acceleration, you might notice that I don't know what IP is, right? It wasn't something that's given. However, this plate is a nice square plate. It's a, it's a regular shape. And I'm betting that you can probably find its moment of inertia in the back of your textbook or something like that. And what I'm betting is if you go to the back of the textbook, you'll find a moment of inertia for uh, rectangular objects. Let's say an object has a width W and a height H. Then it's moment of inertia about the center of mass, right? The center of mass right there would be IG equals, you'll find that's 1 12th times mass times width squared plus height squared. Now, if I want a moment of inertia about some point other than the center of mass, it's actually quite easy to find. So let's suppose I want some moment of inertia about this point P down here. Well, that's actually quite easy. The moment of inertia about point P, that's just equal to the moment of inertia about point G, plus I have to add a piece on here called, it's just the mass of the total thing times D squared, where D is that distance right there, the distance between the point P and the point G, right? And of course, this thing's called the parallel axis theorem. So in our problem, everything is given. Remember, the width of the plate was just twice B, or 2 times B. The height also, since it's a square plate, it's also 2B. And then D, what's D? We can just use the Pythagorean theorem. We say D squared is just B squared plus B squared, which is 2B squared. Woo, and I can, just, I can just plug everything in and get my moment of inertia. And in the end, when you do it, you find that this IP is just, um, what do I get? I got 8 thirds M times B squared. You can check that one for yourself. I hope you do, in fact. And you notice, I hope you notice when you do these things, you check the units sort of along the way. Mode of inertia is a mass times a length squared, where there's a mass and there's a length squared. So that's looking good. 
or at least promising. And now when I put all the pieces together, I should be able to find alpha. Just make the substitution here. I get minus 3 times g over 8 times b. Ooh, interesting. All right, so let's step back and look at the big picture again. Notice I got this, remember I had this px and py equations, the two, the two equations with the things I'm interested in, right? They, they had these forces related to uh, the accelerations of the center of mass. I'm going to call those equations number one and equation number two. And notice also through my moment equation, I came up with an expression for angular acceleration alpha. This, this is an angular acceleration clockwise in the minus k hat direction, as we expected. And what I can do now is recognize that this thing is, that's rotating, that's moving, is a plate. It's a rigid body. These accelerations are not independent. They're sort of related to how the, the body's rotating, because this body's rotating about a fixed point. And because of that, every point on the body has a fixed way in which it can accelerate or move relative to the other points. So I think I have everything I need to finally finish this problem. I just have to recognize those kinematic relationships. So in working out the relationship between the acceleration of the center of the plate and the angular acceleration of the plate around this fixed point right here down in the bottom left corner, let me draw another picture again. In fact, I got the picture right here. In particular, since this center mass point G over here is on a rigid body. It's a fixed distance from my pin point. Therefore, as the body rotates around the fixed pin, this center mass has to traverse a perfect circle, a circle of constant radius about point P, right? The point G cannot get any closer or any farther away from the pin point. And when we have something moving in a perfect circular arc, its acceleration takes a somewhat nice form that we've studied throughout the semester. Remember, in particular, we could split this acceleration into a piece that's tangent to the path and another piece that's perpendicular to the path pointed towards the center. So now I can write the acceleration of the center mass, the center point right here, as a piece I'll call a1 in the e hat 1 direction, where e hat 1 is tangent to the circle, and another one, a2 e hat 2, where e hat 2 is perpendicular to the circle, pointing radially inward. And recall this, let's start with the, the e hat 2 component. So this a2, that's a centripetal acceleration, right? So a2 is just d times theta dot squared if you like so where theta is the rotation angle of the of the plate this is a centripetal acceleration but remember I want to know what the acceleration is I want to know what the forces are immediately after the string is cut immediately after the string is cut the plate is not rotating right it hasn't begun to rotate yet and maybe it's accelerating in fact it has to be accelerating it's got an angular acceleration but it doesn't have an angular velocity so therefore theta dot is zero and this centripetal component of acceleration has to be zero. But for the e hat 1 component, there's a different story, right? A1, that's just going to be the tangential component of acceleration. That's, that's If you think about in polar coordinates, this is, this is an r theta double dot. So really, a, r in this case is a d, that, that distance d times a theta double dot. Theta double dot is just an angular acceleration. But remember, my, my positive alpha corresponded to a, a a counterclockwise rotation, which would be actually giving me an acceleration in the minus e hat 1, so I had to put a minus sign there. Ah, interesting. So my a1 component of my acceleration, this is just d alpha. Alpha I already found from before, right? That was equation number 3. So this is equal to 3g over 8b, if you recall. That's the alpha, and then I have to multiply it by d, or minus d. Remember this thing had a minus sign in there as well. There's my acceleration for the center mass. It's 3g over 8b times d in the e hat 1 direction. All right, so now that we have acceleration of the center mass in terms of things that are given, in the case of d, almost given, we are very close to being finished. The only part is that, remember our expressions for those forces. Let me scroll up here. Expressions for those forces, equations 1, number 2, they had acceleration in the, in the horizontal and vertical directions, right? Whereas now I have... Uh, acceleration in this e hat 1 direction, which is sort of tangent to the circle right here. So all I have to do is put it into, your, into horizontal vertical components. And that should be quite simple if I just define a new angle here. Let's call that angle theta. So in this case, a g would be 3 times g d over 8 b times sine of the angle in the i. And in the j hat direction, I'd have a minus 
cosine theta, like so. Now let's make a quick observation. So first we'll observe that the sine of the angle right here is just this distance right there, which is a B divided by that distance, which is just a D, right? So this is B over D. And likewise, cosine of the angle is going to be what? It's going to be the adjacent side. And since this is a square, it's also B over D. So if we make the substitution sine theta equals b over d and cosine theta equals b over d, notice I have a d over b which just gets canceled exactly out. So what I have left is the acceleration of the center mass is equal to 3 eighths g in the i hat direction and the same 3 eighths g but in this case the minus j hat direction. Ah, I think we finally got it. Almost, just one more step to go. All I have to do now is make the substitution above so the px and the py into equations number one and two that we defined earlier. And we find that px is equal to three eighths of the weight. And that's a positive three eighths. So this thing's actually pushing outward, just like we said it would in the previous problem. And py, if you work out the math, you'll find this is five eighths of the weight. Again, less than the weight, right? Those are my answers. I'm putting a box around them. And we should always check units. I'm expecting a force, right? And what I'm getting is a mass times an acceleration. F equals ma, right? So this is mass length over time squared. And we're good. This completes the problem. We're finished. Good work.